Medical tourism is a rapidly growing industry that has emerged out of people's need to travel across country borders to access medical treatments and procedures. In order to understand this global movement, we need to understand the reason for travel, the destinations that attract individuals and the web of factors that shape this global industry. With the support of the Graham Foundation for Advanced Studies in the Fine Arts, we have with us today Dr. Valerie Crooks, who is a health geographer and a professor at Simon Fraser University in Canada. For more than a decade, she has been qualitatively studying the ethical and equity impacts of medical tourism in countries such as Jamaica, Barbados, India, South Korea, Cayman Islands, to name a few. I am Vaishnavi Shukla and this is Architecture of Center, a podcast where we highlight contemporary discourses that shape the built environment but do not occupy the center stage in our daily lives. We speak to radical designers, thinkers and change makers who are deeply engaged in redefining the way we live and interact with the world around us. Valerie, you've done more than a decade of research on medical tourism. And so at the risk of my question sounding small and shallow today, I want to begin by tracing the origin of medical tourism, if I may. When did the idea of traveling for treatment first emerge? Well, um, people have traveled for care or to improve their health for um, a long time before the phrase medical tourism even arrived into our vocabulary. So, I mean, you can trace back very historic practices of the temporary or permanent movement of people um, in order to access care or to go into environments that they felt were more health promoting or healing. Um, and so, you know, we have a, a history of people moving between countries and even moving between continents in order to improve their health status or to search for a better sense of well-being. Um, and so medical tourism, um, which, I mean, you know, in today's conversation right now between us, we can think of more as an economic sector. This has emerged um, through the recognition that there are deficits in some health systems and there are assets in others that um, some patients will be motivated to travel for, for various reasons. Um, and also just building off of that recognition that we have a longstanding history um, within particular regions or between countries of people moving in order to access improved care. Um, and so the actual sort of economic sector of medical tourism and the phrase of medical tourism has existed with us for a few decades, and it's grown out of a few different kind of recognitions in particular destination countries. So um, oftentimes an early prompt for moving into a medical tourism sector is um, underused or unused capacity within a health system. Mm. Um, and so either sometimes strategically as part of a health system approach or sometimes on a case by case basis in a particular facility or hospital or clinic um, recognition or interest in trying to fill that underused or unused capacity through bringing in international patients. Um, there are also various kinds of very specialized procedures where the local population in a particular country will not be large enough to sustain the practice of that procedure. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's also a reason why we see people sometimes moving between countries. Um, and then there are various other reasons for the emergence of this sector. And so outside of destinations where there's unused or, or underused um, existing system capacity. Um, we have other countries and other sectors that I often refer to as kind of medical tourism 2.0 because mm -hmm. the emergence really comes from what I was just talking about in terms of um, you know, health systems and countries strategically developing this sector in order to use that, use up the space or the capacity within the unused or underused um, health system, um, you know, beds that are empty, um, surgeries that are being unfulfilled, um, often within regional movements. Um, that phrase that I just said, medical tourism 2.0, mm -hmm. I often think about as 
um, you know, destinations where we have seen actually the emergence of purpose-built facilities specifically for international patients. And you can imagine that those two origin stories are very different. Mm. So whether it's a country's public or private or hybrid health system that has under or unused capacity that was originally intended for domestic patients or for patients where there could be some sort of small scale regional movements um, and the kind of recognition that, hey, we could sort of expand this to the international market and fill this is very, very different than the origin of a sector in a particular destination where facilities have been built from the ground up with the intention of attracting international patients. Mm. Um, there are very different types of destinations, very different intentions behind who it is that you're going to be seeking as a patient group, um, different motivations for why people may travel to those sites, as well as very different um, thinking in terms of the economic strategy behind that. So mm -hmm. that's something that I would say in terms of thinking about sort of the, the origin or the, the arrival of medical tourism um, as a sector is that we have these two very different sort of stories of how we've seen this, this emergence. And so you may go to a hospital, um, for example, I've, I've visited hospitals in Chennai, India, mm. where there are hospitals that were, you know, clearly intentionally built for domestic patients, but there will be a wing or a floor um, where you see more international patients coming. So that sort of follows that first type of origin story that I mentioned, but I've also been, um, you know, throughout my travels in the Caribbean region, where I've spent a lot of time doing work and in smaller countries within the region that are looking to diversify their tourism economies. I've been to many very small purpose-built clinics um, or very small scale hospitals that were from the outset designed to attract international patients. Mm. So this is the perfect point to um, end on. And a couple of weeks ago during the Thanksgiving weekend, this one image became very popular in, in um public media it was the flight chart of all the uh, travel people did for thanksgiving in in north america um and i was i was wondering while looking at that in terms of you know if we were to make a flight chart of travelers commuting around the world for medical tourism what are some of the places that emerge on top both in terms of outbound patients but also the geographic locations where people end up going, both in terms of uh, giving and, and receiving treatment. And of course, you mentioned Chennai and we in India are very, very familiar with, you know, having an influx of patients, depending on what part of the country we are in and the treatment that those specific cities offer. But you've also looked into countries like Mexico and Barbados, um, what do you think overall, and because you study human geography, what, what do you think that flight path yeah. looks like? So I'm actually going to take a step back because the question that you just asked is a very logical question. And I get asked that all the time. And the companion question that I get asked to that. So you're asking where are people going to and where are they leaving from? So the companion question is numbers. How many people are going? Mm. How many people leave particular countries? How many people arrive to other countries? Mm. Um, and so these are two very logical questions when talking about medical tourism. Um, and so the answer that I'm going to give you may feel um, not quite satisfying, but this is the truth and this is what we have to think about. Medical tourism falls into what I call the triple use of a global healthcare mobility or transnational mobility, untracked, untraced, unregulated. So... Um, if somebody is listening to this podcast today and they think about the last time that they went abroad to a particular country or that they returned to their home country, um, when you're going through that immigration check-in, did you indicate whether or not you accessed healthcare abroad? Mm. My guess is going to be no. And so this is just a demonstration of the fact that we don't have reliable population level tracking. Um, and so, you know, it's it's not something that's come up as a significant priority, um, and it's not something that we can really track or trace. It is, as I said, a triple U, untracked, untraced, unregulated, at least at the sort of global or transnational level in terms of regulation. Um, and so, you know, just thinking about people's own lived experience when they think about traveling, they haven't been asked. So 
if we expand that into thinking about medical tourism, you can understand actually why all numbers are pretty much wrong, but some are useful. So most of the numbers that we see around medical tourism, so whether they're numbers that would inform kind of a flow map, like what you were talking about, or whether they're numbers that just help us to understand how many people have gone abroad to a particular destination, um, you know, typically those numbers are based on modeling. Um, modeling, uh, mathematical modeling and spatial modeling, they're, they're based on assumptions, educated assumptions, not guesses. They're based on assumptions that help us to sort of understand what the reliable numbers could be like based on a certain number of sort of assumptions built into the model. Um, and so pretty much the numbers that you're going to see, they're all wrong. Mm. Um, and so who's telling you the numbers tells a story as to the numbers you're going to see. Um, and so, you know, if a particular destination is trying to report numbers where they're doing so to kind of help to sort of build, beef up or build up their medical tourism sector, they may overreport. And it, it may not be an intentional overreporting. It may simply be, you know, how they understand what the practice is. So I've seen reporting of the number of medical tourists that also capture within those numbers. Um, the friends or family members who have traveled abroad with the patient. Now, you might stand back and say, wait, why would you do that? But mm. if you think of medical tourism as a diversification of a tourism sector, then you could imagine the driver for capturing those. I've also seen, um, you know, numbers that report the individual procedures that someone has accessed as opposed to the numbers of patients. So you could have somebody going for a series of treatments, somebody could go for a series of diagnostic treatments, for example, in addition to some preventative care, someone may access five different services, six, potentially even more. Um, and so they'll be captured that many times by the hospital or clinic that's reporting. Mm -hmm. Now, is that hospital or clinic setting out intentionally to be deceptive or to give a false impression as to how many patients are coming? No, that's not what I'm, I'm here to suggest. That's simply their way of reporting. Um, but I'm giving you these different examples so that people can understand that actually the basis for finding reliable numbers around how many people are traveling abroad is very challenging. Also, it's a highly privatized um, sector. Mm. And so what is the motivation for um, hospitals or clinics that are thriving to share that information widely um, with their competitors potentially seeing it, especially if they feel like they've broken into a new market. Maybe they really wanted to attract patients coming from the Middle Eastern region and they were successful at doing so. Um, do they want their competitors to know? Um, so unless governments are very reliably requiring reporting and that reporting is coming forward, then you can see why Numbers are part of a story. Um, we should always stand back and say who generated these numbers and what's the perspective that they're coming from. Um, and so, you know, that is what I would what I would say in terms of the response to the question about a flow map. Um, one thing I will um, comment on, and this comes from my experience of doing research on this sector for a very long time, is that I think that there can be a, a very strong focus on sort of the more sensational stories. So the idea that, you know, a dissatisfied patient local here to where I am in Vancouver, Canada, will look for care abroad and they will end up maybe where you geographically are um, in a city in India in order to access that care. So the idea that people are traveling far and wide, going to destinations they've never gone to before, traveling to places that, you know, members of their family have never even heard of in order to access care in a, in a very remote context, um, when actually we know that a lot of the travel is regional. Mm. Um, and then also, you know, something that doesn't get talked about quite often, but something I know very much from my work is that there's also a very strong um, connection to diaspora populations. So people who may be first, second, third generation um, Caribbean Canadian who is going back to visit family over the upcoming holiday period and while they're there, they access dental care. Um, you know, so this is somebody who would be in this in this particular context, a Canadian national. So they are going abroad. They're not going abroad with the intention solely of accessing care, but they're doing so while they're there. Um, there are all different kinds of groups of people who end up 
becoming medical tourists. And just something that I just want to add just for the sake of clarification in our conversation is that when I'm talking about medical tourism, I am talking about instances where the care is intentional. So I'm not mm -hmm. talking about an ill or injured vacationer. Mm -hmm. I'm talking about um, somebody accessing care with intent. Um, typically, they've gone abroad for the purpose of accessing care, but there are also, and this is another reason why it becomes very hard to track, um, we also see the emergence of um, certain kinds of medical tourism destinations where they're trying to kind of capture the local um, tourist market. So with uh, cosmetic procedures or dental mm. procedures that may be yeah. minimally invasive, for myself, I, in my work in the Caribbean region, I've been at many cruise ports where within, you know, 100 meters of the cruise port, you can have many clinics that are offering dental care mm -hmm. or uh, minimally invasive cosmetic procedures to people who are on board. Um, and so in that instance, the person may not have traveled from the outset with the intent of accessing care, but still their access to that care is intentional. It's not that they broke a crown um, in their mouth while they were on the cruise mm. and they went for emergency dental care. Um, so I, I want to make sure that that intentionality comes across because this is another reason why we can also see um, some challenges in interpreting the numbers that get reported around medical tourism because sometimes ill or, Ill or injured vacationers actually get captured in these numbers. And then another sort of distinction that we can make are people who are traveling abroad um, based on their own decision to go abroad um, and are doing so with intent versus somebody that it, their domestic health system has actually covered the costs of them traveling abroad. So that would be arranged cross-border care where um, that happens all the time, where there are countries where, you know, that's part of their, their health system. So it may be a small country, it may be an under-resourced country, or it may simply be even in Canada, for example, we do have the potential for portability outside of the country if a procedure is available abroad and somebody is enduring kind of extensive um, pain and tissue damage, then they can request to have that. So um, these are, are two very different types of travel. And so when I'm talking about medical tourism, I'm talking about that individual who has made that decision on their own, not by referral, mm -hmm. not by approval of their domestic health system, where they are paying out of pocket and they are accessing intentional care abroad. Mm -hmm. um, but I want to share that just so that you and I are on the yeah. same page for yeah. conversation, but also all those different kinds of patient movements that I just mentioned, um, they often get collapsed together to report the number of international patients that have been in a particular destination. And then what'll happen is somebody in the medical tourism sector that is looking to kind of talk very positively about a destination will say, look at all of the medical tourists that come. But mm. meanwhile, you know, a, a large number of them are people who broke their leg on a, <laughs> mm. on a, you know, it, on a waterfall in a popular spot in a tourist de destination and ended up in the hospital in order to access treatment for that. Mm. So and something that you mentioned right now has actually happened with my own mother. I was interning um, in Sri Lanka and my parents had come to visit me and my mother was getting a picture clicked at one of the tourist spots and she tripped over backwards and literally broke her elbow. And then, of yeah. course, we had to, you know, we were exposed to the entire healthcare system because there was a fracture and then we had to fly her back. But but I, I, I know what you mean. Something that I do want to get a little bit into the detail is you mentioned that you know when you fill the immigration form and they ask you about receiving um medical care people would usually answer no if they well no I, I just want to clarify they don't ask you <laughs> like oh, they don't like, ask you okay not, that's, that was the point I was making so typically when you are entering a country when you're returning home, for example, you're typically not asked if you accessed healthcare abroad. So you're ah. asked, you're often asked if you've been on a farm because there's concern about the spread of zoonotic disease. Right. Often asked if you're carrying over X amount of currency with you, uh, because we want to kind of have a sense financially of of what people are coming in with and right. any concerns about that. So the point with that that I was trying to make is that people aren't asked. So it's not so being recorded. Well, exactly. And so this is the point that I was trying to make by using that example is that this is exactly why all numbers are wrong. Because if we are not asking people when they return home, if they act intentionally accessed care abroad, then we, have we no will way to map. know yeah. 
Exactly. We will never know. We, we don't ask them when they leave the country in order to go back home. And we don't ask them when they return home, nor typically do we ask them when that when uh, we arrive. Um, there are a few exceptions to that, but that's just right. not sort of the, the norm. So yeah. understood. Um, can you speak to how certain places have really monopolized certain medical specializations? For example, um, a particular doctor at a hospital in my city became very famous for knee replacements. And because they advertised in a certain way to African countries and had a lot of African patients flying in, there was now an emergence in a number of hospitals in the city which boasted about offering good knee replacement surgeries. Similarly, in Bangalore, there was a hospital that um, pioneered uh, cardiac procedures, heart procedures. And so around that hospital, there was an ecosystem of other hospitals, which became very popular in um, in offering heart-related healthcare. Um, what does this monopolization look like at a global scale, if it does? Yeah, I mean, I don't know that it's necessarily a monopolization, but... Um... You know, there's a lot of networking among people who are thinking about going abroad. So there are lots of chat rooms and discussion boards, for example, websites where patients are talking about their experience. And when people are thinking about going abroad, um, oftentimes they'll look to those kinds of sources for information. And so this is how you can build up a reputation of a particular destination. There's a lot of reputational protection um, in the medical tourism industry. So you can have um, particular hospitals or clinics or even countries as a whole um, that are very much focused on what is their online branding, what is being discussed about them. Um, I have, you know, I'm aware of some clinics that even hire um, outside contractors to help to manage um, social media presence. Um, and I'm not just talking about somebody that supports the content that's going in, but also looking at the comments that are made, um, sometimes also generating the comments that are made. So this is how um, it's possible that you can build up a reputation for a particular kind of destination for a particular procedure. You know, most people that are traveling abroad are not going to be trained medical professionals because most people just aren't trained medical professionals. Um, and so it can be very hard to know how you pick uh, a hospital or a clinic. Um, mm. you know, we often, I, I hear in my work so often, you know, destinations looking to brand themselves. In my conversations with medical tourists, um, which have been numerous by this point in my career, um, I very, I've very rarely come across somebody that picked a destination. People are also very rarely picking a hospital or a clinic. Um, that might happen more if it's a cosmetic type of procedure, mm -hmm. something that's minimally invasive, um, something where the clinic as a whole offers a single procedure. And so that's the only thing you're going to go for. What people are typically going for if you're dealing with surgery is they're going for a specific practitioner and mm -hmm. they're going to that person is based. Yeah. Um, so this is why I'm saying it's not really a monopolization. It's just simply that, you know, it doesn't, it doesn't take a lot of research um, as somebody who might need a knee replacement, like you were talking about, um, to know that one of the things you want to see is um, an orthopedic surgeon who has done a, a good volume of that right. particular procedure, because the, it's very likely then the, the outcomes are going to be better. And so, you know, patients start sniffing around, they start looking at where can I find that? And then through word of mouth, they, they start to hear about a particular um, provider. And then that's what gets the focus in a particular mm -hmm. topic. Mm -hmm. um, something you, you wrote in one of your research papers um, was, was very um, deep and insightful. You, you wrote about how medical tourism may benefit destination countries, but they also may worsen health inequities, both in the destination countries and in the pa uh, patient's home countries. What are some of the factors responsible for this? Yeah, so, you know, this this kind of questioning comes from the line of thinking that I have around medical tourism. So in the work that I've done, I've not focused on surgical outcomes, um, which is a kind of conversation a lot of people would like to have with me. Um, I haven't focused on the cost of a procedure and destination A versus destination B and doing economic analyses. 
Um, I've been doing work that asks ethical and equity questions um, with all kinds of collaborators, um, including a close collaborator of mine right here at Simon Fraser University, um, Jeremy Snyder, mm. who is a bioethicist, and we've asked a lot of, of ethical questions. And so one of the kinds of questions that I've been asking in this work and my colleagues and I have been asking is who benefits from this practice? Um, and I'm not talking necessarily at um, the level or the scale of a single person, but also at the scale of a destination. So what are the harms and what are the benefits, um, both for patients' home countries as well as for the destinations? So in relation to destination countries, um, you know, I was mentioning earlier in our conversation this sort of origin of some medical tourism destinations emerge because they have underutilized or unutilized capacity within their health system. Mm. And they're looking to offer that to international patients. But in other cases, you have purpose-built uh, purpose built facilities or clinics um, specifically for international patients. And in relation to that latter kind of example, it's not uncommon that things like tax incentives have been given. Um, there's oftentimes international investment coming into the country in order to um, bring foreign dollars in to allow for the creation of a particular hospital or clinic. Mm. But how does that actually benefit the health system locally? Um, you know, if you are coming in, bringing in international investment monies, building a purpose-built clinic, you mentioned, for example, a heart hospital that's known in India that has a particular model of the procedure that's been exporting it. Well, there's a heart hospital in, um, that started in Cayman Islands that you know, was brought forth. Exactly. Yeah. So in, in that instance, you know, somebody exported a model from India, it landed in Cayman Islands. But the question is, how does Cayman benefit from that? Mm. Um, how does its health system benefit? You know, if you're given tax incentives, um, the, the location of where that clinic was built, there was some waiving of environmental protections um, and environmental assessments. It was one of the last lands where the endangered blue gecko was living. Um, you know, you have a fairly small country that is providing resources infrastructure wise yeah. um housing wise in order to support the presence of this clinic how does this feed back into benefiting the local economy but also the local health system how do we ensure that hospitals and clinics that are purpose-built to attract international patients are not poaching health workers out of the domestic um, system mm -hmm. in ways that are harmful? How do we make sure there's enough capacity within that host country in order to make sure that we are not harming its own health system locally? But also, again, what are the spillover benefits? We could imagine medical tourism as being highly privatized and think about it as being its own particular aspect of the health system. But if a health emergency happens, that patient is going to land in the public hospital typically or in a private hospital in the country that is typically kind of um, built with the intention of domestic patients using it. Um, and so there's a lot of kind of spillover. And so it raises a lot of really challenging questions in terms of how do we ensure that there are benefits. And you know, so medical tourism, it is an offshoring kind of sector, right? You're talking about, well, especially in that medical tourism 2.0 model that I talked about. So, you know, international investor comes along, they help to build clinic a clinic here, um, their money, uh, any profits may be returning internationally, possibly with some staying domestically. Mm. International patients coming into said hospital, um, oftentimes some local workers, but it's not uncommon for um, surgeons and uh, trained medical professionals to be also coming internationally. You know, there's lots of offshoring sectors, but the thing is that in with medical tourism, we're seeing it's at the intersection of an offshoring sector and health as a basic human right. Um, and so that's why I think we need to ask particular kinds of equity driven and ethical questions in a way that maybe we wouldn't ask those same questions of a telemarketing uh, company that started in the same location that also was was brought yeah. in by international investment and may um, you know, have its executives and senior level management as being uh, coming in internationally as well. So I just want to sort of um, frame that so that you understand why it is that I've been asking these questions. But then, you know, up to this point, I've been telling you about how I think about it and the kinds of questions I ask in destinations, but also patients' home countries. 
um, you know, there are ways in which um, there can be harms, but there can also be benefits. So, mm. you know, I'm talking to you right now from Vancouver in Canada, where we have a, a public health system that has no payment at the point of service provision. It's funded through taxation. Um, and so you might kind of say, well, you know, if somebody chooses to exit the system um, and go abroad for care, that's their choice. There's no harm to the system. It's just right. that one less person in what could be a bottleneck, one less person on a wait list for a hip replacement or a knee mm -hmm. replacement. But, you know, at the sort of smaller scale, it's not uncommon um, for patients to be asked to undergo particular kinds of testing. So to request blood tests, to request other tests to be done before they arrive abroad. So that's a point of intersection between someone's decision to go abroad privately and the public system that I, is here within mm -hmm. Canada. Um, and then also when somebody returns, if they were going, for, and I'm just using the hip and knee yeah. uh, replacement because that came up in, in your example, but when they return, they're actually going to need to have follow-up care. They're going to need to have the kinds of community referrals, but they haven't actually received the care locally. And so they may actually be disrupting the follow-up care kind of wait list in our sort of plan for that. So this is, is one example of how we can see sort of local impacts in the home country. It also, um, if you have a lot of people exiting a domestic system, whether it's a public system, like what I was talking about in Canada or something that's highly privatized, if you have people leaving because they're not able to access a particular type of care domestically, um, then sure, on one side, you're lessening a bottleneck, but on the other side, you're you're removing the pressure for change and the pressure for reform. Um, so this is also another sort of potential criticism of medical tourism and how it may not entirely be helpful for patients' home countries. Um, but there are other kinds of impacts in sort of the home context as well. So you know, for more invasive care, it's really common for somebody to travel abroad with a friend or a family member, if not more than one. So then you have those people's intersection and interaction with the health system, um, those people who are taking their time off of work. Um, so you can really, what happens is that one individual person's decision to travel abroad for privately funded health care um, that's intentional in the context of medical tourism actually impacts a whole network of people and actors, um, some of whom are there because uh, and receiving those impacts because they're in an economic sector that's looking to benefit from the practice. So they're there to actually be impacted and they're looking forward to what that impact would be. But there's others that um, may be impacted quite negatively. Um, and you know, another example at, at a kind of thinking about that sort of finer scale of resolution, you know, I have absolutely heard of and I know firsthand experiences, not from my own lived experience, mm. but from conversations I've had with patients and physicians, instances of a patient's choice to pursue medical tourism as resulting ultimately in a fracture between a longstanding positive relationship between patients and physicians, mm. because, you know, it's not entirely uncommon for patients to be driven to look abroad for healthcare that they're not going to be able to access domestically because they're not a viable candidate. Yeah. So, you know, one example might be bariatric surgery yeah. where you have to be within a particular weight range. Yeah. Um, and so in, you know, people's minds, they might be thinking about people who are very overweight, but actually you can be underweight. You can be an, a not an advisable patient for bariatric surgery. Bariatric surgery is not devised for those people that can't lose that final 10 pounds. But when you're talking about, um, you know, the ability to go abroad, to pay for the, the, the care that you want, um, and to use your money to get the outcome that you're searching for, regardless of what the harms might be, if you are willing to accept those harms, those potential negative health outcomes, you can use your money to talk and to get you what it is that you're looking for. Um, and so, you know, you can see in those instances, there have been many, many complicated documented cases of patients returning um, from accessing care abroad that they were, they should really never have been able mm. to get. Um, and then coming to, back to their home countries and requiring extensive care and treatment. Um, that also happens in instances where 
you know, someone may be exposed to, um, you know, a particular kind of a negative consequence of the procedure, and then they're back in their home country trying to deal mm-hmm. with it. But, you know, I just thought I would mention, um, you know, that our, one of the things that, that people will go abroad for are procedures that they are not a candidate for at home. Now, sometimes that could be due to, um, gender identity. It could be due to a religious right. belief. And right. so, it may not result in a fundamental harm, but sometimes it's due to you're not an advisable candidate because you've already had four hip replacements in your lifetime, or because you are underweight for bariatric surgery, or because if you receive procedure X, Y, or Z, it will interact negatively with this other ongoing care that you're receiving. And so that counseling is not aligning what with what the patient really needs. And so against the advice of a local um team or a local doctor, one goes to another country where such questions are probably not as regulated or as asked and still go through with it, kind of putting their own bodies in danger. Right. That's right. And this is not, I wouldn't say that this is the most common driver for medical tourism. This is something that, that can happen. You know, you can enter a different regulatory environment where something that you were uh, you couldn't access at home because it was unproven and untested right. because it was unavailable or because you were not a candidate. So it's, it's available, mm. but you are not a candidate for that in your domestic context. You can go on the global market and say, Hey, where can I get this done? And, um, and yeah. you know, th- and that, that kind of driver around medical tourism, um, you know, is going to have a whole spectrum of outcomes for some people. It's life-saving, you know, they were being denied fundamental care in their home country because of, you know, it could be a, a religious practice because of gender identity, because of some other aspect. And so the ability to go abroad is life saving and life changing. But then in the other instance, um, as I was giving you some examples, you can have people going because they're not a viable candidate domestically, you know, because also medical tourism um, can prey very much on um, hopes, people's mm. hopes. And mm. so you can also have, you know, people who are experiencing incredibly life-limiting contexts, uh, people who are willing to take a chance on anything, people who are willing to go for whatever the extreme is to see what kind of outcome they can get um, in order to potentially um, have a, you know, less life limiting, less life limiting hmm. um, context. And so that's sort of another, and that, that can take you really into the untested and unproven areas where, you know, you'll have um, some stem cell clinics and stem cell procedures that are being offered that are really preying on the hopes of people who are in incredibly challenging um, circumstances that are life limiting. Um, and, you know, hopefully, by the by, from the clinic's perspective, they're hoping that that um, these patients will be willing to pay literally whatever it takes um, in order to see an improved outcome, even though the evidence base may not be there. Because again, you can shift um, regulatory contexts in the practice of medical tourism, and so the protections that you have that may prevent you from um, interacting with such a clinic in your home jurisdiction may not be there in the international just out of curiosity do people travel to receive attention for mental health or is that something that hasn't yet received as much attention when it comes to medical tourism um yeah that's a great question as i said earlier on it's very difficult to get any trend information um, with regard to medical tourism, um, you know, I I wouldn't rule out people traveling or not traveling for any type of procedure. I've talked to people who have traveled for all types of, of procedures. And also, um, you know, I've there are people that travel abroad for certain kinds of um, therapeutic engagements. Mm-hmm. There are people who are traveling abroad for residential treatments as well. Um, and so that can certainly fall within that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Oh, I only asked it because the wellness industry is quite big. And, you know, a lot of times people equate mental health to wellness. And so that that boundary between the two can get quite blurred where someone might have an actual mental health condition, but you might not be able to map it as um, 
as in detail as say going to a wellness resort or you know going to a detox center or something last question valerie um in 2020 we saw both the aspects of medical tourism come to the forefront where of course because of the pandemic the um, health infrastructures of countries was put to test and you rightly mentioned that this can be broken down into one the public health system and the private health system and tourism came to an absolute full stop um, what happens to the medical tourism industry in cases where pandemics or geopolitical crises really make the movement of people very very limited so you know, one of the things that medical tourism requires is ease of movement. Mm. And so, you know, earlier on in our conversation, you were asking if I could sort of, if we could kind of have a mental map of where people are leaving from and where people are going to. And I explained the reasons why it's actually really challenging mm. to do that. But there are some things that we could say about where those arrows would be. So, you know, countries that are very difficult to leave because of, um, because of um, domestic, like because of violence within the country, because of instability, because almost anywhere you would want to go from that country, you would require a visa and it's very hard to access that visa. Then similarly, countries that you would ultimately want to go to, you need to be able to get in them. Um, and typically as low barrier as possible, if you're talking about accessing medical care abroad. So again, countries where most people entering will, will require visas, countries where it's challenging to get the visa, countries where um, there are disputes that challenge your ability to actually even enter, where you see flights being canceled and things like that. Um, you know, these are all things, as well as, um, you know, and we see this happening annually um, in relation to health emergencies as a result of climate change um, that actually shift your access to whether it's something like an airport or even your ability to travel. These are all things that pose as barriers to that ease of movement. Um, for medical tourism to exist, you must be able to move with relative ease between countries. Um, the higher the barrier is to to move between countries, the less likely that someone is going to sort of overcome that barrier in order to access care. Because what'll happen is a market will open up somewhere else that is lower barrier. Mm. Um, and so, you know, the pandemic certainly provides us with a very recent lived experience of what happens when that barrier, it becomes incredibly high for most people. Um, but there are other things, as I just gave you some examples of um, various kinds of geopolitical circumstances, um, you know, weather-based circumstances and others that can sort of result in impacts in, in that ease of movement. Um, you know, the medical tourism industry um, itself, it was, I'm sure, very much on pause during the pandemic, as were most other travel-based sectors. Um, you know, people's need for care would never have left mm -hmm. if it was, you know, in, in relation to a surgical procedure or whatever it might be. Um, but people's ability to travel abroad in order to address that need changed dramatically. Um, and so I'm sure that, you know, the medical tourism sector in many destinations has worked really hard on marketing, um, has worked really hard on encouraging people to come. And then, you know, one of the other things that's happened as well is that our lives have very much um, turned to a greater ease of access to um, virtual mm. uh, um things such as even right now, your conversation with me via Zoom. I know one space that I've um, heard about the medical tourism sector as really kind of having a robust emergence or re-emergence following the pandemic is the fact that many of us were sitting on Zoom screens watching yeah. our own faces for months or years at a time, um, growing with displeasure because it's almost like staring at yourself in a mirror. Mm. Um, and so, you know, some destinations have really tried to take advantage of that by um, coming back with competitive pricing and competitive packaging for um, dental procedures and for cosmetic procedures in order to sort of use that as a way to sort of rebound and get things going uh, back for, um, back for rebuilding the sector following um, the pandemic, reasonable kind of mm. shutdown mm. period. Mm. Yeah. Final, final question. Um, what are you working on right now in this area and what's next? Um, so I'm, 
It's funny because I would have said the same answer. Uh, so like for the last many, many months, I have a final chapter that I just need to write for a book that I'm working on about <laughs> apologies. So I've, I'm working on a final chapter for a book I'm working on about my research on the medical tourism sector in the Caribbean region. Mm. I'm looking at what are some of the sort of key lessons that I've learned across the travels and across the countries and destinations that I've been in. Um, and so also my work on medical tourism has exposed me to other transnational health mobilities um, that I have also started to pick up on in my research. So, um, you know, I have, through my work on medical tourism, um, interacted with many international retirement migrants, so people who travel abroad seasonally. Um, so in, in Canada, we often call them snowbirds, seniors mm. who leave for the winter and return back. Um, in many destinations, they are medical tourists, um, but there are a lot of um, healthcare complexities with with regard to their journeys that I've been looking at, as well mm -hmm. as um, within the Caribbean region as well, um, a companion or parallel uh, mobility that's really been emerging are offshore medical schools, um, which is an offshoring sector yeah. as is yeah. medical tourism for international patients. And so there are a lot of parallels in terms of the kinds of equity and ethical questions that I ask about this research, even though training to be a physician is very different than practicing <laughs> on international patients yeah there are parallels between these mobilities and why both of them are um you know being planned and being scoped out in in the caribbean region so these are some of the projects that i'm working on well thank you so much for your time it was lovely speaking to you i was really looking forward to this to this conversation yes you're welcome um it was a pleasure i'm always happy to chat with people about <laughs> medical tourism. Special thanks to Ayushi Thakur for the research and design support and Kahan Shah for the background score. You can follow us on Instagram at Arc of Center and reach out to us through our website arcofcenter.com. That is A R C H O F F C E N T R E. And thanks for listening.